Sure. Um, okay, so uh, way, way more in, uh, of details uh, within this talk. Uh, so short outline. Um, I, I want to give some, some motivation uh, of, of the deep essentials and, and give you an overview uh, of the project. Um, then, of course, um, so our project is, is kind of application driven, so we, we are doing quite some hardware development and, of course, also software development uh, for on, on, on the system level. But nevertheless, we, we have included in the project um, application that have the potential to, to get s s at some point of time to the exascale. And so we, we think of the project as a kind of application driven project. So then of course, um, yeah, many, many details on the, on the hardware design, on the system software, what we are doing there, and then finally some conclusions. Okay, so you of course all know this, this type of slides. So uh, uh, looking at the, 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 the scaling of, uh, of various technologies uh, over the uh, decades. So, and um, yeah, so quite well known, of course, is, is Moore's law, which gives you per decade about a factor of 100 in, uh, in, in performance uh, uh, of, of your processor technology, uh, which um, is not really true for, for supercomputing, where you actually get uh, a factor of thousands per decade. So, which means that uh, with, within HPC, we not only rely on the uh, uh, development of the, the basic technologies, but we uh, uh, furthermore really gather more and more parallelism, uh, not only with, within the nodes, but, but also outside the nodes, so, which means machines uh, tend to get bigger and bigger. And um, yeah, if, if, if you look into the details um, of uh, technology scaling, you, you see that uh, yeah, so d during the, the, say, last decade, or uh, so starting somewhere around uh, 25, uh, 2005, so this, this kind of uh, saturates. So uh, we don't see this factor of 100 uh, per decade, but, but just a factor of 10. Um, uh, so, and in, in order to, to face this, uh, uh, this, this damping in technology development, of course, uh, we, we go in, into multi-core, many-core, um, in, increase the, the amount of parallelism within the socket, and uh, somehow we, we have to, re of course, reflect this in, in HPC too. Uh, yeah, so this, this factor of 100 per decade, of course, is well known as Moore's law, um, yeah, uh, we, we, we call this factor of 1,000 in 10 years in, in HPC as a kind of uh, Moyer's law. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we really have to work hard in, in order to, to, to keep up with, with Moyer's law in order uh, yeah, to, to, to really get to access scale by the end, end of the decade. And of course, so th this is the, the goal of, um, of our uh, current work. Um, Talking about exascale, of course, you have to look into the uh, scalability of the applications. Of, of course, reaching exascale is, is not a target by itself. So um, the, the target is to, to get a machine uh, that is capable to, to, to solve the problems that, that uh, yeah, the, from the application fields is connected uh, to, to exascale. And um, having a look at the, the machines that we run in Jülich, so and basically this, this is, a, is a blue gene system and a cluster system, you can roughly divide uh, the, the applications uh, into uh, two classes. Of course, on the one hand side, uh, there, there, there are these highly scalable applications that we run in Jülich on our blue gene system. So applications that are really able to, to scale to uh, several hundreds of thousands of cores. Um, uh, so typically, uh, uh, these are yeah, kind of sparse matrix vector codes uh, with highly regular communication patterns, so, and really well suited for, for blue gene P and, and now for, for blue gene Q. Um, on the other hand, uh, so most of the application from the application portfolio in Jülich actually 
don't really fit that well on, on the blue gene. So from the number of applications, of course, from the amount of computer time used by the applications, um, so these are really in the, in the highly scalable part, but if looking at the pure amount of, of applications, so these mostly uh, run uh, on our cluster system. So uh, in, in, in our case, this is the Europa system. And looking into the details of, of this application, so they're way more complex. So, so they don't necessarily have the, these highly regular communication patterns. So they, they uh, are, are not that regular on, on the node level. So say they, they don't have these regular access patterns to the, to the memory. So they, they have many, many branches in, in that. Uh, so, and uh, of course, uh, these type of applications are really hard to run, say, on, on a blue gene system, or, or yeah, even worse, if, if you want to run uh, these type of applications on an on a accelerator type of, of processor, so say on, on a GPU or on an Intel mic. Um, nevertheless, taking a, a deeper look in, into these um, less scalable and, and more complex applications, uh, you find out that they, um, yeah, often also have some more highly scalable code parts. Uh, but, uh, yeah, due to the fact that they, that they also have less scalable code parts, they are not really able to, to make use of, of a system like a blue gene, so of this highly scalable system. So, and uh, now we ask us the question, uh, so how can we improve these type of applications? And, and we expect that these type of applications um, might become uh, more important if, if you go to exascale. So these type of applications might be kind of, yeah, um, coupled code. So, so say if, if you have some multi-physics code or if, if you couple some, some um, physics content to some chemistry content. So for, for example, if you go for atmospheric research or climate research. So, and we ask us the question, how can these applications really profit uh, from, from this uh, technology development and how can we help these type of applications. So um, really going into the details of, of course, we, um, uh, we, 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 we have to uh, um, act with the laws uh, invented by these uh, uh, two, two gentlemen. So of course you, you know Gene Amdahl and, and, and his, his law on, on strong scaling which basically just means, so, so if you have a, a, a serial part in your application, um, yeah, it's, it's just one over uh, this, this serial part, basically, with what you can gain from, from, from a parallel machine. Um, then Gustafsson said, uh, yeah, this is true, but, but not completely, because uh, so if you go to a larger machine, you typically also scale up your, your application. So, which means we, we usually don't really have to face strong scaling, but uh, yeah, in fact, we, we have to face some kind of, of weak scaling. So now, uh, and now, now our idea was, uh, well, in, in order to, to, to face both, um, uh, so, 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 so if you put together different technologies, so say standard uh, CPUs and, 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 and GPUs, so is it possible to, to, to map the, the, the various um, um, yeah, uh, capabilities to, to, to make use of scalabilities, uh, maybe to, to these uh, uh, various um, um, processor architectures? So can, can we make use of not only one concurrency level, so, so just putting everything in parallel, but um, can we make use of several, of, yeah, say, say starting with, with two concurrency levels. So may, can we maybe just put highly scalable code parts on a highly scalable part of the machine and, and map the less scalable code parts on a, on a, on a smaller part, but, but more capable part for, for this specific um, uh, use cases. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we, we really just rewrite uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, yeah, scalability formulas uh, uh, related to that. Um, so, and yeah, to, 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 to even more uh, motivate that, let's, let's have a look at, at today's cluster. So typically you, you have some CPU nodes connected to, to some uh, 
usually in InfiniBand fabric, so but uh, a, a not really highly scalable um, fabric, but an, uh, yeah, more or less uh, flat uh, fabric. Um, so n not, not a torus-like fabric or something like that. Um, so which, make, which makes management of resources really easy. And then connected uh, to these uh, um, CPU nodes, usually th there are some, some accelerator type of devices, so say GPUs or, or Intel, Intel Mic uh, 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 accelerators today. Um, so n now the question is, uh, is, is uh, so, so uh, w what can we gain from this type of architecture and, and what type of, of trouble is introduced by that? Of course, so what is one problem is this static assignment of, of uh, re resources. So uh, you, you have a static assignment of accelerators uh, to, to CPU nodes. And uh, if you uh, have to run uh, a, 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 a big variation of applications at, as we have to do in Jülich, so this might be complicated. So on the one hand side, there are applications that can make use of no accelerators at all. In, and uh, on the other extreme, uh, you, you have applications that could make use of, say, two or, or four accelerator devices per node. So, and, and, uh, so but, but with this type of architecture, you, you're, you're quite static. And, and you can't really handle this, this, this variation of, of applications. Um, so, and, and, and the key problem for that, as we figured out, is that these accelerator type of devices today can't really act autonomously. So, and what you really want to have is, uh, so for, for your accelerator devices is, not, 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 is nothing like these clusters with, with accelerators, as, as I want to call it, but what you actually want is a kind of cluster of accelerators. So, so really have accelerator devices that can act autonomously and, um, and uh, yeah, which set up their, their, their own type of cluster. And uh, then in the end, in, in order to, to get the flexibility, what you, uh, so what, what we think what you want to have is, uh, yeah, a, a kind of cluster of accelerators attached to a cluster of CPU-like devices. So, and this cluster of accelerators um, we call a, a booster. So, a, a booster device set, set up out of booster nodes with some highly scalable uh, fabric, which not necessarily gives you really a flat topology, but a, a more restricted topology, which typically is, is no major problem since these highly scalable code paths usually uh, also have really highly regular communication patterns, so which you uh, most probably can really map quite well on, onto a, a, a torus-like uh, fabric. But on the other hand, of course, this torus-like fabric gives you the, uh, the, the, the ability to, to really scale up your, your architecture uh, at, um, to, 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 to a large scale. Um, yeah, and, and then on the other hand, of course, you, you, you have this standard cluster with, without any accelerators as, as you know it uh, from, from the last decade. So, and with this type of architecture, you can gain uh, uh, some flexibility. So if, if you have an application that, that is only consistent of a highly scalable code part, so if, if you look at applications like, say, Lattice QCD, you can just map the, the, the whole application uh, to the booster device and, and have a kind of um, yeah, high, highly scalable machine, so some blue gene-like uh, uh, machine on, on the right-hand side. On the other hand, if you, if you have a, 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 an application which has no really scalable part at all, you can just map it uh, on the cluster side. And this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gain you, you, you get from this cluster booster architecture. You can also handi handle any application in between. So uh, if, if you identify some highly scalable code part in your application, you just map this part on the booster side and let the, uh, the uh, re remaining part, uh, and so leave, leave the remaining part here on the cluster side. Um, Okay, and uh, so th this was the, the basic idea that we had, and uh, so based on this idea, we, we wrote some proposal to the EU, and then were successful to, to get in uh, a, a funding from EU, and so what's, what, what 
came out of this funding now is, is this D project uh, set up uh, between uh, 16 partners from, from eight countries uh, all over Europe. Uh, so um, we, we have three praise hosting partners involved. So uh, it's, it's uh, BSC, so Barcelona, it's LRZ from Munich and, and Jülich. Uh, we, we have five industry partners. We uh, started uh, yeah, a, a, about one year ago, and we will work for three years in order to do a first implementation of this cluster booster architecture. Uh, so, yeah, this gives you just an, uh, a brief overview on, on the uh, uh, D partners. Um, so, uh, in, in order to, to really set up these, these booster parts, so, so we don't really have to talk too much uh, about the cluster part. We, we, we all know how cluster computing works, at least in principle. But so now we, we really have to talk about the, the, the booster part. So, um, and for the booster part, um, yeah, well, we, we have some special requirements on, on, on the hardware devices. So, for, for example, uh, we really need an, uh, uh, an, uh, an, an accelerator type of device which can act autonomously. And so if you look at today's uh, GPUs, uh, you, they, they are not really able to, to, to run autonomously. This most probably will, will change in the future. Of course, you all know these announcements of NVIDIA on, on attaching some ARM cores to, to their GPU devices. And once uh, they are there, um, of course, you, you, you can also think about setting up uh, a booster from, from these type of devices. But nevertheless, today we are really, uh, so the, the only possibility to, to Im implement something like a booster, uh, and, and so without doing some hacks like uh, yeah, putting yet another CPU on, on the board, which of course impacts your energy efficiency. If so if you don't want to do that, uh, so you are really re restricted to the Intel Xeon Phi. Um, of course, you, you might argue, well, so if, if you talk to Intel, they, they don't tell you that you can run an, an Intel mic autonomously. So you, you always need this host CPU uh, be beside your, your Xeon Phi in, in order to boot it and in, in order to, to feed uh, software into it. Um, so we, we talked to an uh, Intel research lab in, in Braunschweig and they yeah, so, and, and we, we, we were able to um, convince um, higher level people in Intel that it's actually possible to, to run that autonomously. And so this is one important part of, of the D project. So to really uh, set up a an, an, an booster out of uh, mic without the direct help of any host CPU. So in, in order to, to make uh, Xeon Phi uh, uh, acting autonomously, what's really important is, is the uh, fabric that we want to use in, in the booster part. And we decided uh, to go for, for this x technology, which is uh, developed at uh, University of uh, Heidelberg, in the group of uh, Professor Bruning. Um, and so the, the key features are, uh, so you, 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 you are able to, to set up a, a 3D torus uh, out of these devices. They are um, yeah, quite intelligent, and especially they are able to, for example, set up the, the PCI bus. And they are able um, yeah, to, to, to run without, and, and they are able to, to come up without the help of, of a local CPU. So uh, once all, all these XTOL devices are connected, so they are able to find each other and, and to, to set up the topology, to set up the local PCI bus to do the memory mapping, and with that, they are able uh, to, to really boot the, the Intel Xeon Phi. Um, what, this was too quick. So furthermore, they have, uh, so Xtol provides uh, several types of, of communication. And I will come back to that because this is also an important part in, in order to, to couple both parts uh, of the system. Um, yeah, so to, to give some performance uh, figures. So what's available today is, is, uh, is a, yeah, not, not really Im impressive implementation, but this is due to the fact that, that the current XTOL implementation is based on FPGA. Um, so which means it's not really cost efficient, it's, it's not really high performance, but it's working, so functionality is there. Um, currently they are on the way to uh, 
to uh, implement an, an, an ASIC version of, of the fabric. And once this ASIC version is there, and so currently they are in the process to do tape out, and uh, with, within the summer we, we expect to, to have first silicon. So once, once the, the uh, ASIC is there, so we, we, we expect a link bandwidth of about 120 gigabits per second. So then you have six links in order to set up a 3D torus. And actually you, you even have a seventh link which we use within our project for some um, special features. So for example, to, to do the connection to the, um, to the cluster part or to uh, yeah, have some um, l large hop links so in, in order to um, yeah, f find a shortcut uh, w w within the fabric. And uh, yeah, quite some, some ex uh, uh, Im impressive uh, uh, latency and, uh, and, and message rate numbers. Um, so, and, and then putting both parts together, so uh, a, a booster node just con consists of an uh, of a Intel Xeon Phi, so of a, of a KNC, uh, device, uh, which was the code name of the current uh, Intel Xeon file. Then, of course, some memory at attached to the KNC, and then you you, you have these, uh, these, this this X toll device, which basically consists out of uh, a NIC and and a router device. So it's 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 just uh, uh, yeah uh, attaching the, the the actual NIC uh, uh, to an uh, to, to a small switch, and uh, which in the end uh, enables you. Uh, to do some uh, uh, routing uh, within the torus uh, w without the, the direct help of, of the NIC. So the, the NIC is not affected if you just have to route through some, some messages. Um, so th this is the basic setup of, of a booster node. Yeah, and in fact, uh, so the, the, the hardware implementation uh, uh, w will end up in, in not only have one booster node, but to have two of these nodes, so, so just, just a copy of the first node uh, on, on one BNC card. Um, yeah, so I already mentioned we really have to do some hacks and some uh, improvements on, on the uh, OS running on the, uh, on the mic, so we, we, we have to enable for remote boot, and uh, yeah, I will come back to that later. Um, in a little bit more detail. So, uh, as I said, Extol is able to, to, to bring up the fabric uh, autonomously, so without the help of, of, of all the local CPUs. So you basically just need one CPU in order to bring up the fabric. Once the fabric is up, uh, so all the Extol devices can talk to their local memory, and so we, we just have to teach them that they have some local memory within mic. And then you can boot up the mic in a way that, uh, yeah, from, from at least one point within your fabric, you, you, you just um, inject uh, the, 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 the boot kernel in, into all the mic devices and then just you have to flip some, some bit and then the mic starts to, to jump to some memory address and executing the, the code there. And so this happens and to, to be the Linux kernel running on a mic. Um, so, this, this is more or less, let's see, the hardware part of the project. So then, of course, uh, we also want to have a look within this project on the, um, uh, on, on, on this PUE discussion, and especially we want to learn if, uh, if, uh, yeah, if, if you get some gain from, from uh, redesigning the, uh, the, the, the cooling stuff. So we want to go for, for hot water cooling in, in this context and already have set up some, um, uh, some infrastructure for that uh, in, in Jülich. Um, and uh, especially the, uh, all, all the cluster and booster hardware will be direct water cooled. Um, I have some more details on that later. And uh, then, of course, what's, what's really important, so we, we, we have a quite complex hardware setup, and now the question is, uh, how can you present this hardware setup um, to the application developers? So, uh, of, of course, they don't want to really um, yeah, tear their, their, their whole application um, um, apart, but uh, so we, we, we have to provide them some path uh, to, to uh, yeah, 
really as smoothly as possible port their applications to this architecture. So, and for that, we, we, we end up with, with this quite complex uh, software stack. So, as you see, there's on the one hand side, there's a cluster, on the other hand, there's a booster. Of course, you, you have all these standard tools, so, so you, you have some um, Intel compiler running on both sides. Um, we also go for, for the, the OMS compiler, so for the OMPSS um, um, task level parallelism system uh, developed at, at Barcelona. Um, this is also used on both sides. So then, of course, you, you need some low-level communication libraries, so both for the Extol part and for the InfiniPen part. Um, we, we will provide an MPI on both sides. Um, so for your less scalable code parts, of course, so this is just on a standard cluster, so it's, it's a standard cluster way to program that. For the highly scalable code part, so we expect that, this, that our applications also are based on MPI, so which means we also need an MPI on the, the booster side of the system. And that, then, of course, you, you, you have to find a way to, to couple both parts of your applications together. For that, you, you need some cluster booster communications, which really bridges between, the, uh, between both um, interconnect technologies we, we have on both sides. You, you need some kind of global MPI, which helps you to, to, uh, to, to move data back and forth between both parts and to, to really start processes on the booster side. Um, then, uh, really important, we want to give some kind of, uh, we, we put some kind of abstraction layer on top of that in order to, to help application developers to, to split up their, their applications uh, with uh, as less impact on their actual code as possible. So, and then on top of, of this stack, you can run your applications, with, which consists of a less scalable code part, which remains on the cluster, and with some highly scalable code part, which can be put uh, to the booster side. Mm. Yeah, I already spoke about applications. So we have um, six guiding applications from six fields. Um, I will come back to, to the applications in, in the middle, but um, let me give you just some, some historical hints. So, um, yeah, so this, uh, at the first glance, looks quite novel, but uh, in, in fact, th this, this idea is, is not that original at all. Um, if you look back, uh, well, o almost 20 years, so there, 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 there was uh, uh, an interesting development in, in Italy. So um, there were um, lattice QCD physicists having um, developed these, these ARPA Cento and then later ARPA Miller type of systems, which were dedicated lattice QCD machines. Um, yeah, with so kind of simply architecture, really well suited for, for lattice QCD. And then there, 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 there was a company founded called Quadric Supercomputing World, um, and they wanted to commercialize this architecture. And their idea was to, to couple these ARPA uh, Cento machines, so a booster, uh, to a Mako or Cradic Supercomputing World CS2 uh, system, which was, I think, based on, on Spark processors with, the, with, with a um, uh, really fast interconnect at that time, which then later happened to become the Cradic network. So, and uh, if, if you look at the, the architecture, so you really see, so that you, you have this cluster attached to a booster. So, and... Uh, yeah, so I was really surprised to find out that this idea that we just had some years ago, uh, so two years ago, was, was not really that novel at all. Uh, so unfortunately, so, and uh, they had really big plans for a, co a system called Codex PQE 2000, where they wanted to have the, the next generation ARPA system, so the ARPA Miller system a, a, attached to a, to a cluster. But for some reason, they, they never made it. Um, uh, so it, it, it was not due to the fact that the idea was stupid at all, but uh, so I, I think the, the, the Arpeggento system was quite of late, and, and then they, uh, they, they turned around and just concentrated on the high-speed network. And, uh, so, and so what in the end came out of, out of that was, was the Cortex network that you might know. Okay, so coming back to applications. 
Um, so as I mentioned, we, we, have, we have six applications or applications from six fields. So one is uh, yeah, uh, from, from Switzerland, uh, so from, from EPFL, Henry Markram. So it's, uh, it, it's brain research, brain simulation. So you, you might ha have heard uh, of, the, uh, of the Human Brain Project. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, so these, these, these are really the, the people behind uh, Human Brain. And uh, so the idea is to, to, to have at least part of their uh, application stack currently developed to report it uh, to the deep system and uh, to find out if, if they can uh, profit from, from the, the idea of, of the deep architecture. So uh, second field is uh, climate simulation. So we, we have the Cypress Institute involved here. Um, so they just couple uh, yeah, atmospheric chemistry and, and, and climate um, condition uh, to each other getting a, a, a quite complex code and uh, they try to port their application uh, uh, to the cluster booster architecture of DEEP. Uh, then we have uh, Cellfax involved. Uh, they are doing computational fluid engineering and uh, yeah, port their application uh, to DEEP. Then there is uh, Chinica. Um, they, uh, they, they are doing quantum Monte Carlo investigation on high temperature superconductivity. Um, then uh, we have uh, CZ, CGG Veritas from France. Um, they are doing seismic imaging, and uh, so this is also an, an application that uh, is quite, yeah, quite promising to, to report it to, to deep. And then last but not least, we have some space weather application from, from Leuven. So as you might know, space weather is uh, yeah has not too much to do with our weather, but it's uh, it's basically the the influence of the sun on our atmosphere, and uh, so these these effects might be quite dramatic. So if if you have these these sun flares, so if if the sun is sending some high energy particles uh, or some some more or less concentrated beams of high of, of high energy particles to the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic atmosphere, uh, you, you, you can en end up with really uh, dramatic effects. So you, you, you might destroy uh, satellites, uh, you, you might destroy ground infrastructures, uh, so for, especially these, um, uh, these, uh, these, these high voltage transmission lines. Um, so you, 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 you can end up with, with really in, in, uh, in inducting High um, um, uh, with, with, with inducting high high volt, uh, yeah, even higher voltage in, into that and, and destroying infrastructure. So and for that, it's really important to be able to, um, uh, yeah, to 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 predict the the uh, effects and to predict uh, if if you have these sun flares, if if it will hit the Earth and and what will be the the effect on the uh, magnetosphere of, of the Earth. And for that, uh, they are on the way to, to set up uh, these so-called space weather predictions. Uh, so currently, they, 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 they're trying to do that, but the, the, the resolution uh, they, 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 they can reach right now is quite poor. And in order to, to really be more predictive and, and to, to, to give some safe predictions, um, yeah, they really have to go to exascale in, in order to do that. So these are our, our guiding uh, applications. Um, so during the first year, the, uh, the application people really analyze their applications and, and try to find out what are the parts of the applications that they can put on the booster, with what part has to remain on the cluster, and yeah, what, what are the requirements they, they give to the especially to the software architecture. So what, what, what kind of functionality do we, from the system software point of view, have to provide to them in, in order to, uh, yeah, to, to, to port their codes? So uh, they have done this in the first year, so now they are on the way to, to port the, uh, the, the highly scalable code parts, or at least the, the, uh, the, 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 the on-node part, to the Intel microprocessor. And, and once we, we, we have a very an, an early, uh, functional prototype of the um, 
boost or part, then they also in, in, in include this, this parallelism there. Uh, so, and we expect this to, to be in, in the second half of, of this year. Okay, so having said that, let's have a, 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 a close look on the, um, on the hardware developments uh, within the project. Um, so this, again, gives you a an, an high-level overview uh, on the architecture. So you, you have this cluster part, and we are using Intel Xeon Phi here. So Intel is, is one of the partners in the project. We have the booster part, uh, which is uh, with, with Intel Xeon Phi as the booster nodes, uh, interconnected by a, an, an extra 3D torus. And then there are these, these red boxes. Uh, yeah, I have not yet spoke spoken about them, uh, so, but these are quite important too. These are the so-called booster interface cards or booster interface nodes, and they, on the one hand side, bridge between the two fabrics, so between the extra fabric and the InfiniBand fabric. Um, on the other hand, uh, they um, yeah, help us to, to boot the Intel Xeon Phi devices. So, in fact, uh, in, in this nodes, there, there, there is sitting the, 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 the host CPU that is necessary in, in order to, to, to boot the Intel Xeon Phi. And uh, yeah, basically, so, so each booster interface card is responsible for, um, for, for, for eight of, of these booster nodes. So, and, and once the, the extra fabric is there, so these are the, the host CPUs that, um, uh, that inject the, uh, the, the, the OS um, uh, image uh, into, into the Xeon Phi memory and, and then trigger the, the Xeon Phi's uh, to boot. So this is a really high level um, architecture. I will not concentrate too much on the cluster part, but of course on the booster part where we have to do actual hardware development. So. Um, of course, so let's start from the highest level. So we have to implement some booster technology, uh, uh, topology. Um, so the, the idea is within the project to, to have a booster uh, consisting out of 512 uh, Xeon Phi devices. So as you have seen, uh, two of them integrated uh, within one uh, booster node card. And uh, so then they are put into, uh, into chassis of the uh, of, of, of uh, Aurora technology developed by our partner Eurotech and then uh, yeah we, we stack several of these uh, Aurora chassis uh, within one booster rack so we in, in we, we will end up with with one rack of booster nodes and uh, so this just catches the the high level topology so this this just catches the 3D torus uh, that, that we want to, to implement there. Um, of course, in, in order to, to uh, enable this Aurora chassis uh, for, for the deep booster, uh, we, we have to develop a, a, a new backplane, so a backplane that is capable to, to hold these, these mic blades and to, to uh, implement the 3D torus uh, of, of the x -tol. Uh, yeah, so as, as a technical detail, so we, we don't have one big backplane per chassis, but two half planes. And um, yeah, so and, and we, we, we have one dimension, so the X dimension just implemented uh, within the backplane, and the other two dimensions will be implemented with cables, so between the, the chassis devices. Um, we figured out that we can run uh, the, the, the whole fabric with, within one booster rack with just copper cables. So if we really want to scale up the system, so if we find some money after the project, um, so then uh, we, we, we have to go for, for optical links uh, in between racks. But uh, so it's, it's really possible to, to, to scale up this, uh, this technology. Um, yeah, we, we made some, some simulations in, in order to find out that, that really the, the eye is open enough in, in order to, to, to put everything together and, and, and to, to get a good signal integrity be, between all the booster nodes. Um, then, of course, the, the next device we have to um, um, develop and implement 
is, is this booster interface card, so this is big. And so the, the high level design is you, you, you have some host CPU, so um, uh, yeah, we, we will use some, some Ivy Bridge um, type of, of CPU there. Then uh, we, we, we will have uh, a, a, a Mellanox uh, HCA, uh, which uh, yeah, it, it attaches to the uh, cluster fabric and then of course an, an, an XTOR device attaching to the booster fabric. So uh, in, in the very first generation, so in the prototype generation, we, we will um, stick with FPGA. So this, this is currently under development and then in the next step we will uh, uh, jump over uh, to the ASIC, and then what's what's really important here is is, is is a PCI Express, which which yeah more or less directly interconnects between the two fabrics, and I will come back to that. So we we made some interesting development in in order to to really efficiently couple both devices and use some special technology of of XTOL there. So but I will come back to that later. Uh, yeah, so this, this is just a sketch of the, the hardware design. So we, we, we will use as the, 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 the actual host some uh, Comp Express card here in, in order to re reduce the um, uh, amount of development that, that has to be done there. And then, um, uh, yeah, so as the actual compute device, uh, we develop a, a booster node card, a, a BNC, uh, so which consists out of um, two PNC devices, um, so not really directly mounted to the uh, to the PCB, but uh, so in, in a very first prototype, we, we just use the standard PCI Express um, devices that you can get from Intel right now. And in the final implementation, we want to go for some uh, dense form factor cards uh, of of KNC here. So, and then, uh, of course, there are these XTOL devices. So, in this sketch, it, this is still FPGA. And then, in the next step, is we will move over to ASIC and, and then some, some board management um, in order to, to yeah, do switch the power to do some monitoring, this, this type of stuff. Um, yeah, so for the FPGA and standard PCI Express based devices, uh, so this, this is a, a this, this is a picture of, a, of an early prototype that we have shown at, uh, at the SC conference. It was located at the Jülich booth at that time. And um, so that, 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 there is already some hardware available. Um, and here you, you see the, the detail of the direct water cooling. So, um, uh, yeah, so, it's, so the technology is, is based on, on cold plates. So there, there, there is a yeah, this Manhattan-like of uh, cold plate um, um, uh, design, which will be pressed directly uh, on, on onto the, the actual uh, hardware on the booster node card. And uh, so as you see, there, there are two valves here, uh, which uh, enable um, cooling water to directly flow through this uh, uh, cold plate. And uh, yeah, we expect that we can uh, that we are able to, to run the system at about 40 degrees Celsius um, cooling water. So, and with that, of course, we, we want to, um, um, yeah, yeah, gain uh, free cooling and or, or me, maybe even uh, try to um, be able to, um, to, to get some, to get back some of the energy which is in the cooling water. Um, yeah, okay, so this is just a sketch on, uh, so w what type of te technology is, are available here, and w so what we, we, we decided to go for this direct cold plate uh, uh, technology, ending up with yeah, this fancy design uh, of this Manhattan Skyline profile um, <coughs> um, cold plate uh, de developed by Eurotech. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned, so we, we set up some infrastructure in, in Jülich, so um, yeah, uh, set up some, some dry coolers in, in order to be able to, to, to use um, um, free cooling. And so this, this is already installed in Jülich. Uh, another part of the system that is already installed is the, um, 
is a cluster part of the system. So we have one rack consisting out of 128 uh, cluster nodes uh, uh, based on, uh, on, on Sandy Bridge CPUs interconnected by uh, QDR and Finiband. So this is pretty much the, the standard uh, stuff you, you can get from your check uh, in, in this uh, Aurora uh, design. So then there, there is this service rack which yeah, holds um, uh, PDUs on the one hand side uh, so you, you, you don't have 220 volts uh, in, in the cluster rack, but just 48 volts and, and, yeah, and, and, and cooling water and that. And then uh, so that there will be this, this booster rack, uh, yeah, which houses quite, quite similar um, uh, Aurora chassis, but then not equipped with, with cluster node, but with, but with uh, booster nodes. So the, the cluster part is set up. We, we uh, yeah. Uh, have done some acceptance runs, uh, started with some first uh, power management, furthermore ins installed some, some infrastructure around that, so some login and management nodes, some, some servers for, for, for file system, uh, have some storage, um, of course administration network, and uh, most importantly we, we also started to, to install sensors. So this is yet, yet another important part of the project. So we really want to improve the, the monitoring uh, that we can do there. Um, yeah, so infrastructure monitoring is there. So we, we can really control the, the, the temperatures, pressures, and flows of, of the uh, cooling water in order to find out so um, how, how is energy usage and, and how does the system behave on changes uh, of the environment. Um, another important part is the, the uh, RAS framework. Um, so in, in order to be able to, to really do a high frequency monitoring, we, we have to set up some extra infrastructure there so to, to really get all the uh, performance and energy and uh, uh, counters out of the system and in order to really uh, be able to um, uh, yeah, to, to, to match these parts. Um, yeah, so this, this is most of the stuff I have to say on the hardware. So now let's come to the software architecture. I already presented this slide. Um, so uh, a few details on the OMPSS. So if you're not too familiar with that. So as I said, it's a development of... Um, of uh, BSC, so the group of, of uh, Jesus Labata. And the, the key idea behind that is that you don't explicitly um, um, yeah, im, 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 uh, implement the, um, yeah, say the, 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 the data flow uh, between the several parts of your application, but that you just um, uh, annotate the, the interdependencies of, of your data in your code and then you have an, uh, a, a, an, 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 an mechanism that, that extracts these interdependencies and creates some, um, uh, some directed graph of these interdependencies. So it, it just tears, tears apart your, 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 your big applications into, into small tasks which are yeah, more or less stateless. Um, sets up the, the dependency graph be between all these tasks and, and then there is a runtime which, um, uh, which reschedules all the tasks and which is aware of, of the interdependencies. Uh, so the, the idea um, behind that is to truly really decouple um, uh, the, 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 the thinking and, and, and how we write an application and, and yeah, typically we, we, we think in, in a more sequential way from how it's actually uh, executed. So, and uh, yeah, as I already uh, sketched, so we, we, we use this uh, on, on both parts. So you, you, you can see this as a kind of replacement of the, uh, uh, of, 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 of the uh, 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 OpenMP concept. So th this is an alternative way to to implement the parallelism that you can implement with, with say, OpenMP um, in a yeah, maybe more 
uh, if efficient way. Uh, so at, at least from the programmer's point of view. So, but of course, this is only uh, one problem that, that we have to implement, but the, the more important part that we, we really have to invent here is how to really start up an, an application on, on this complex architecture. So, and as I said, uh, we, 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 we expect to, to have an MPI application and that the, the, the um, uh, from, from the uh, code point of view, uh, the, the major part will remain on the cluster. So the, the main part of the application will remain on the cluster, will be an MPI program there. And then we have identified some highly scalable code part and now we have to think how can we start these highly scalable code parts on the booster side of the system. So, and the idea is that there isn't collective operation of all the um, uh, uh, of, 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 of all the MPI processes on the cluster side during some spawn of this highly scalable code part on the booster side. So, and this is really completely different from, from the offloading that you know from, from standard accelerated clusters. So, there you always just have a, have, a, have a local code part which is offloaded to the local accelerator. So, but deep is really different. So the offloading is a collective operation of the less scalable code parts, which offloads a highly scalable code parts on multiple booster nodes. So the, 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 the code part that is offloaded is actually a kind of parallel application in itself. So you, you are not forced to, 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 to just offload um, a, a local compute kernel, but what you're offloading is a, is, is an, is an uh, a parallel code part. So, for example, if, if you identify that your highly scalable code part is, say, a, 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 a sparse matrix solver, then you really offload the, the whole sol uh, solver um, to the booster. So, then sends in some, say, a candidate uh, uh, for, for the solution of, of, of these, uh, uh, of these uh, sparse matrix. Um, do all the iteration on the booster and then get back uh, at some point of time the, the, the full solution vector of, of your space, uh, uh, of, of your sparse matrix. Um, so, and now the question is what type of technology do, do we use in, in order to do that? And what we then found out is that actual uh, MPI2 has some nice interface in, in order to, to, to really do that. And, and for that, uh, yeah, we, we then uh, have to implement some, some global MPI. So one slide on the MPI. So the, the MPI we are going for is the power station MPI that was originally developed by Partex. So in the meantime, uh, this is handled by the so-called power station consortium. Um, so the, 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 the main partners there are, are Jülich on the one hand side and, and Partex on the other hand. So Partex is also a partner uh, with Indeep. And um, yeah, so as I said, the, the uh, overall programming model is based on MPI. We, we use power station MPI on both parts uh, of the system. Uh, we, we extend the, the power station MPI to be able to, to handle the X toll, to be able to handle the cluster booster communication. Power station MPI is based on MPH2, so works out of the box on the cluster part. And yeah, we have to do some improvements in order to, to port it to the booster part, so to, to be able to, to run on mic, to be able to, to handle XTOL. And so the, the, the basic idea is that, so yeah, it, it integrates with, with some cluster management software developed by Partech. And yeah, it, it's based on, on a library called PSCOM, which supports different interconnects uh, through one API. So it's, it's a kind of really low level abstraction layer for that. So, and then based on this MPI, the actual offloading is done uh, with a global MPI and we found out that there is a MPI com spawn call in the MPI2 standard, which is really well suited for, for our needs. So uh, what is the, the idea behind MPI com spawn? Well, so, Within your MPI com world, on the cluster side, you can define some MPI communicator of cluster nodes that decide to spawn some highly scalable code parts. So, 
Of course, this communicator can also be MPI convert. And then you, you do a call to that, and this spawns new processes. So in our case, the, these are sent to the booster part. These new processes run on a booster node. They are their own, they form their own MPI convert, so they can talk to each other, which is important uh, for our highly scalable code parts. And furthermore, they are able to talk to each other. So there are, yeah, in, uh, intra communicators, so MPI converts within both parts, and there are inter communicators, which enable uh, the processes running on the booster nodes to talk to all the uh, to, to, to talk to, to the processes on the cluster node and vice versa. So, in fact, this, this call really gives all the functionality that, that we require. So you, you can spawn new processes, these new processes can talk to each other, and they can talk back to their parent processes. Um, okay, so in, in order to, 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 to really implement that, uh, yeah, basically we, we, we have to implement these two um, operations. And uh, yeah, so what is really important, uh, there has to be some possibility to do, to do data transport back and forth between the cluster and the booster. Um, of course, we, we don't really want to force the application developers to, to, to do the low-level implementation of this MPI com spawn and to reorganize uh, all, all their data. So our idea is to, to have some abstraction layer there. So to, and this is the second use of OMS in, in the project. So uh, we, we use OMS in order to um, abstract the highly scalable code part into a kind of, of OMS task. So this OMS task is completely different to the OMS task that run locally. So this is, is, a, is a huge parallel application on the one hand side, but on the other hand, so what is offloaded to the booster is also just a task, and it's, it's a more or less stateless task. So it's, it's clearly defined what is the input data to the ta task, so what has to be moved over to the booster, then you have some operation there, and then you can get back some results. And uh, so, but what, what happens in between is, is really completely abstract to the, uh, and completely yeah, abstracted from what happens on, on, on the cluster side. So, and this uh, brought us to the idea that it should be able to, uh, yeah, use also some kind of offload uh, annotation. So, you, you, you just uh, allocate some, some booster nodes and, and then you, uh, so it, in, in, in the same fashion as you annotate your, your local code in, in order to, to split it up to all the cores that you have locally, um, you, you do some annotation in, in order to, to move over some parts of your code uh, to the uh, booster. So, and uh, yeah, maybe we, 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 we end up in, in, in being able to, to the, do the offloading in, in a way that, that you yeah, really just have to define uh, your, your local or your, your, your cl cluster data distribution, identify the resources on the booster side, um, identify how to distribute your data on the booster side, and then uh, everything else is handled by the runtime. So that, that's the key idea behind that. So I already mentioned it's, it's really crucial to be able to push data back and forth between the cluster side on the booster side. For that, you need some cluster booster communication. So you, you have to find a way to, to, to really um, uh, bridge the, the, the gap between the two fabrics. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned, um, Xtol has some nice functionality there. So basically, Xtol Im implements three types of communication. So on the one hand side, RMA, uh, yeah, which is just uh, re remote uh, DMA. So th this is what we all know from, from InfiniBand and all the other high performance networks. So we use that for bulk data transfer. So then there's this VLO, so the virtual engine for low overhead. Uh, this just gives you high message rate for, 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 for small messages, so you, you can implement nice zero copy MPI with that, and this is useful for small and medium messages. And then last but not least, there's this SMFU, so the shared memory functional unit. So this gives you the, the functionality of, of a non-coherent virtual shared memory, and we use that in order to, uh, to do the bridging to the InfiniBand. And uh, so, with using that, uh, we really found a, a very efficient way to, to, to really implement this cluster booster communication with very, very low overhead. 
So what's the key idea behind that? So you, you, you have some cluster node with some HCA, uh, you, you have the booster interface with, with an HCA and a NIC, and you have a booster node with an XTOR NIC. So, and you, of course, so if, if you want to uh, move data from the cluster node to the booster node, um, so this is what you, what you want to do in order to, to offload and in, in order to, to start your highly scalable code part on the, on the booster side, you have to copy data, yeah, basically you do the booster interface and then forward it to the booster node. Of course, you can do this in a, in a very simple uh, way. So really just do these hops. So um, copy data to the booster interface, having running some daemon there which receives the data, um, stores it into the local memory, and then so once everything is there, forwards it. Or maybe does it in, 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 in a smarter way with, say, multi-buffering, so splitting data uh, in, in, into small parts. But now uh, this SMFU comes into play. So what you actually can do is, uh, with this SMFU, you can map the memory of the booster nodes into the PCI Express address space of the booster interface. And what you actually do in, in order to do some communication between the memory on the cluster node and the memory on the booster node is, uh, well, we, we are doing some RDMA operations over the HCA but we don't write into the local memory of the booster interface, but we write into the local address space of the booster interface, and we write to this place of the local address space where the memory of the booster node is mapped to. So which means, um, yeah, basically we, we do this RDMA write operation between cluster node and, and booster interface, but these, these uh, operations are within the PCI express space of the booster interface, uh, are transparently mapped uh, to, to, to yet a, a, another transport, which ends up in the uh, booster node's memory. Um, so which means the, the, the process of the booster interface is only marginally in, involved here. So the, the, the process on the booster interface just has to set up the address space, and then everything else happens without interference to the, uh, to, to the process of, of the booster interface. So everything is handled within PCI Express. Um, so that's the easy way. So you really end up with this complex operations to just more or less directly copy data from memory on the cluster node into memory on the booster node. So what, what ab about the other way around? So once you, you have completed your operations on, on your booster, um, so within the highly scalable code parts on the booster, of course, you, you want to copy back the results now located in the, boost, in the booster node's memory to the cluster node's memory. Um, well, so this is a little bit more complicated. Um, so you have, to somehow how it, you have to somehow initiate the transfer. So this is done from the booster node. So it, it triggers some mechanism on the booster interface. And now you again do just an RDMA write between the booster interface and the, the uh, cluster node. So this is a standard uh, InfiniBand RDMA write, but the, the source of this RDMA write on the booster interface, again, is an address mapped via SMFU into the memory on the booster node. So which means in order to do your write uh, to the cluster node's memory, you, you have to locally read, but the, the read is forwarded, so the read request is forwarded to the booster node. Here, then you actually do the PCI Express read and the memory read. You get back data. So data is forwarded since, since the, the, the read was done by the HCA, is forwarded uh, to the HCA and then the HCA sends it uh, to the cluster node and here the, the PCI Express write and, and in the end the memory write is done. So what you really have to ensure is that your read queue is large enough, but as long as your read queue is, is large enough, you, you also for the, the, the other di direction of communication have a very efficient way to, to implement that. So we have implemented that and um, yeah, okay. So again, you, you do a more or less direct copy from memory to memory without interference of the, the local CPU and the booster interface. So we have implemented that, and so these are the key performance figures. So the red line is the RMA limit of the XTOL. Of course, currently the, the XTOL is a limiting device here. So since we are based on, on, on this FPGA implementation, 
So the, the maximum bandwidth yet that you can see over, over this implementation is, is a little bit more than 900 megabytes. Um, if you do these, these simple message-based implementations, so where, where you have a daemon, daemon sitting on the booster interface receiving data and then forwarding data, so what, what you can get is, uh, well, uh, 350 megabytes, something like that. But if you really implement the cluster booster protocol, you, you see that, uh, uh, yeah, that, that you really can get to, to the extol bandwidth here. So you, you really see this, this is a very efficient and, and low overhead Im implementation of this cluster booster protocol. Okay, so this is pretty much what I wanted to say. So, uh, yeah, what, what are the takeaways? Uh, um, yeah, we want to implement uh, a, a more or less novel architecture. So you, you have seen some people had this idea about 20 years ago, um, which hopefully paves the way uh, to exascale. So we, we see this as an um, evolution of, uh, of the cluster architecture. So we really um, uh, do an evolution in a, in a a little bit different way to, to some heterogeneous uh, cluster architecture. So this, the project is application driven. Um, yeah, we, um, we, we, we do a first realization of, the, the, of this cluster booster architecture, so based on uh, Intel C on Phi and, and XTOL. Um, yeah, so the, the, yeah, we are looking into energy efficiency. So what is, from my point of view, really the, the most important outcome is the cluster boost operating system, uh, which should be um, yeah, re re really independent of, of the, the actual hardware implementation we, we have right now. So which should open up the, the, the cluster booster idea also to, to different hardware platforms one, the, once these hardware platforms are there. Um, yeah, and if, if you have uh, more questions, or if you have questions, so I'm still here and open for questions, or you can have a look at the at our project homepage, uh, which is here. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>